On June 2, 1985, a man named Charles Ng was arrested in a San Francisco hardware store for attempting to shoplift a vice. It would have been an ordinary arrest, but the officers at the scene ended up getting more than they bargained for. As they took Ng into custody, a friend of his turned up to pay for the vice. That man was Leonard Lake, and as police soon found out, shoplifting was the least of these men's crimes. The ensuing investigation soon unearthed the gruesome fact that Lake, along with his accomplice Ng, had been quietly and horrifically torturing some 25 people in a remote cabin in the Calaveras County for the past two years, and that was only the beginning. But before we dive into this heinous event in the history of criminology, if you are new to the channel, why don't you drop this video a like and subscribe to stay up to date with the latest in YouTube horror. With that being said, these are the disturbing tapes of Leonard Lake. In 1971, long before he ever met Charles Ng, Leonard Lake was in a dark state of mind. He had just been medically discharged from the United States Marine Corps following two tours of duty in the Vietnam War. During his last tour, he suffered a mental breakdown and was later diagnosed with a schizoid personality disorder. Of course, Lake had been showing signs of this disorder for years. It was just the first time anyone had gotten close enough to diagnose it. But Lake was a boy everyone who met knew there was something off about him. Born in 1945, Lake was often referred to as a bright child, though bright was the extinct of the praise. After his parents divorced when he was only six years old, he and his siblings moved in with his grandmother. Though his grandmother appeared to be a source of support for the children during their parents' separation, it seemed that she may have also have been a catalyst for Lake's depraved personality. When Lake was found forcing his sisters to pose nude for photographs, his grandmother looked the other way. When he became obsessed with pornography and started extorting his sisters to perform sexual acts, she didn't lift a finger. And when Lake was found killing mice and other small animals and dissolving them in acid, she again did nothing. By some accounts, his grandmother even encouraged his nude photography. It would seem that the lack of structure or punishment for such acts left Lake with an open door, with nothing to curb his psychotic instincts, and these simply evolved into his future acts of horror. Following his graduation from Balboa High School in San Francisco in 1964, Leonard Lake enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Of course, we already know how his two active duty tours in Vietnam ended, following what Army medical techs deemed a delusional breakdown. He was discharged and sent back home. Around this time, Lake discovered a hippie commune just outside of San Francisco and dropped out of college after only one semester at San Jose State University to embrace the blossoming free love lifestyle that was slowly taking over the American West Coast. By 1975, it seemed that Leonard Lake had overcome his disturbing past. He settled down in the commune with a wife he had met there. But before long, the woman he had married found out about his sordid interests. After discovering that Lake was making and appearing in homemade amateur pornography films, the marriage and his life at the commune came to an end. He spent a brief stint in prison in 1980 after stealing a car, but despite these setbacks, Lake managed to move into Greenfield Ranch, another hippie settlement in Northern California that focused on living off the land. He met and married a woman named Clarilyn Balaz affectionately known to him as Cricket, who he met while working at a renaissance fair. Balaz was everything Lake's first wife wasn't, particularly when it concerned Lake's private interests. While his first wife divorced him after finding out his pornographic hobbies, Balaz accepted them and even offered to star in Lake's amateur films herself. For the next eight years, 
Lake lived on the ranch with his wife and continued feeding his deep, dark desires. After a while, however, it appeared that these amateur home videos were no longer enough to satisfy those desires. By 1983, Lake began to seek out and act on yet more sadistic fantasies. Whether driven by his schizoid personality disorder or simply the constant mounting paranoia most Americans experienced concerning nuclear war at the time, Leonard Lake began to believe that the world was facing an impending nuclear holocaust. In order to survive this disaster, Lake created a survivalist bunker. However, the owner of the Greenfield Ranch halted these plans and forced Lake to take them elsewhere. To his delight, he discovered that his wife's family owned a cabin in the woods, which they were more than happy to rent him. Recovered from one of his diary entries was his sinister plot, called Operation Miranda, during which he would in 1983 restart in Humboldt County and turn his bunker into a physical setting for my sexual fantasies, security for myself and my possessions and limited protection from nuclear fallout. It is also believed that shortly after moving into the cabin, Lake invited his younger brother Donald and friend Charles Gunner, who had served as best man at his wedding to Balaz, to the cabin. Whether they entered his dungeon willingly is anyone's guess, but it was clear that the men had been killed there. After their deaths, Lake stole any cash they had on them as well as their identification and began to pose as Charles Gunner. These deaths hardly quelled Lake's desires, however, and in 1981, he posted an ad in a Wargamers magazine, looking, presumably, for another victim. What he got instead was an accomplice. Charles Ng was incredibly and disastrously similar to Leonard Lake. Though 15 years Lake's junior, Ng had followed an almost identical life path. As a child, Ng had developed a serious case of kleptomania, becoming well known in his Hong Kong hometown for his sticky fingers. Following his expulsion from a British boarding school for stealing from his fellow students, he attempted to continue his education at the College of Notre Dame in California. Again, similar to Lake's own past, Ng only lasted one semester. After being involved in a hit-and-run accident, he joined the Marine Corps to avoid prosecution. Unfortunately, his manic tendencies were no match for the Marines, and he was dishonorably discharged in 1984 for desertion. Whether Lake intended for Ng to be his next victim, or whether he saw the same psychotic tendencies in the young man as he had himself, Lake invited Ng to live at the Balaz's cabin in the woods. This union proved to be a match made in hell. Over the next year, Lake invited Charles Ng into his dark world of torture and murder, and the two began their infamous killing spree that stole the identities of their victims so as to procure loans in their name and continue building their survivalist fortress. Their history of kleptomania and identity theft would be their undoing, however. Between 1983 and 1985, Leonard Lake and Charles Ng kidnapped, tortured, raped, and murdered between 8 and 25 people, mostly women, in their bunker, perhaps in a bid to prepare for the impending nuclear holocaust when they would be required to repopulate the earth. The scope of their crimes is still undetermined, as is the total of their victims. Police remain unsure as to the team's true kill count as they only found the remains of 12 people on their property and suspect that there could be at least a dozen more, judging by the 45 pound collection of charred human bone fragments they found on the property. The two men would hold both male and female victims in the 6.5 by 3.5 foot cinder block bunker with only a bucket and toilet paper inside. The bunker was also lined with a one-way mirror for the two murderers to view through. Following the murders, Lake would dismember and destroy the corpses of their victims using a trick he learned as a child, dissolving them in various chemicals and acids, then sprinkle whatever remained of them throughout the grounds of the cabin. 
Among their positively identified victims were a local man named Robin Stapley, another local named Paul Cosner, a couple who lived up the street named Harvey and Deborah Dubbs, and multiple local children. Among Lake's belongings, police found videotapes of the men torturing and raping their victims. In some cases, the partners made to watch their wives sexually assaulted before they were both killed. One victim, Deborah or Debbie Dubbs, was so violently sexually assaulted on tape that she could not have survived the ordeal. The men hogtied various women, forced them into oral sex and orgies, or put them in leg irons. The sex captives were aged anywhere between 12 and 20-something, and only six of the women featured in these home movies were later found alive. Fifteen of them remain missing still. According to the former cellmate of Charles Ng, the serial killer once bragged to him about sexually torturing and disfiguring women with power drills and pliers. The pliers he used to rip off nipples, asserted a power drill attachment of vaginas, shoved rods up anuses, and broke knuckles with vice grips. The men seemed to have no particular type besides their infinity for torturing women, as they were also known to have killed children and men. In at least two instances, they kidnapped and killed a family of three, including neighbors Lonnie Bond and Brenda O'Connor, who had a two-year-old son. The only common thread between the victims was apparently their vicinity, whether out of laziness, convenience, or some combination of the two, the men never looked far for a target. During this rampage, for whatever reason, Leonard Lake felt that he should record himself explaining his personal philosophies as well as interview victims before raping and murdering them with Charles. I happen to have this tape, and I felt that it needs to be shared as it is a famous piece of criminal psychology used as a case study for academics. But these tapes did contain brief nudity which I had to censor, so the obvious black bars are not part of the original, they are my edits. Also these tapes contain some very sensitive subjects as well as verbal and physical abuse, so this is your warning. Good evening. It's a Sunday in October. 22nd, 23rd, something like that. Very close to my 38th birthday. And I'm starting this tape without script or without any real organization of what I want to say. But I do feel a need to explain. What I want is an off-the-shelf sex partner. I want to be able to use a woman whenever and however I want. And when I'm tired or bored or not interested, I simply want to put her away, lock her up in a little room, get her out of my sight, out of my life. Slave, there's no way around it. Primarily a sexual slave, but nonetheless a physical slave as well. And I believe that I can if I can construct a holding cell, a place where I can put such a woman, a facility that is so stark and so empty, so cold, so quiet, so totally removed from the world, that I can quickly condition a young woman to cooperate with me fully. If you go along with this, cooperate with this, we'll be as nice as we can to you within the limits of keeping you prisoner. If you don't go along with this, we'll probably take you into the bed, tie you down, rape you, shoot you, and bury you. So, my lady, time's up. Make your choice. Uh, I don't want to be available. Don't we want you here? While you're here, we'll keep you busy. You'll wash for us, you'll clean for us, cook for us, you'll cook for us. That's your choice in a nutshell. It's not much of a choice, unless you've got a death wish. Yeah, I don't 
ever arises again, if there's any circumstance whatsoever that leads me to think that you're even attempting to make noise, it's immaterial as to whether I hear you or anyone else hears you, you'll be whipped very severely. And tell me you understand. I understand. I'm having a little war within myself between what I want to do and what we might call it the decent thing to do. And for the moment, the decent thing to do is winning. So, rest. Okay, I just want you to know that I'm getting this stuff to you under protest. <laughs> Not that you'd care, mind you. Taken away. Excuse me. Uh, Who may be taken away? There's a family down in Fresno that doesn't have a baby. You're not taking my baby. Better than the baby's dead, right? I mean, they got one now. That's my baby. Brenda, I you have a. Your baby is sound asleep, like a rock. Uh, you're, we don't like you. Would I like me to put it in writing? It's done. Just take it, whatever we tell you. Don't cut me, girl. Nothing is yours now. You get totally ours. I'm going to pass out into the night or something. Well, you can pass out, but we won't look you up. Brenda, I have a lot of animosity against you, and I would just as soon start you out with a nice firm whipping right now to make you believe how serious we are. So, I thought I'd unbutton my vest again for you. <laughs> And since you were into my sweet little half. Nice and soft and padded so we don't make marks, but nice and firm too. That's for We talked about underage performers and uh, but I've seen some awfully cute looking little 14, 16 year olds that uh, I can be that I wouldn't mind watching them do something interesting. However, the quiet rampage of Leonard Lake and Charles Ng lasted only two years. In 1985, thanks to petty theft, the two killers were finally caught. In June of that year, while on a trip into downtown San Francisco, Ng attempted to shoplift a vise from a hardware store. The clerk caught him and held him back, threatening to call the police. Ng panicked and called Lake who made his way down to the store in an attempt to pay for the vice and smooth the situation over. Unfortunately, by the time Lake arrived, so had the police. Even more unfortunate was that they picked up on Lake's abnormal behavior quickly, and instead of releasing Ng, began to question Lake as well. Things went from bad to worse when Lake handed over a driver's license that bore no resemblance to him and it was discovered that the man in the license, Scott Stapley, had been missing for several months. Furthermore, police found a gun equipped with an illegal silencer in the trunk of Lake's car, which was registered to a Paul Cosner, another missing San Francisco resident. The car and the gun were enough to arrest Leonard Lake, 
not to mention the shoplifting Charles Ng. Following their arrest, the police searched the cabin dungeon and found several stolen vehicles as well as some 40 pounds of crushed, burned human bone. Authorities also found treasure maps in the cabin that led them to buried 5-gallon buckets. One was filled with enough stolen identification papers, credit cards, and personal belongings to lead police to believe that Lake had killed at least 25 people. The other bucket was even more disturbing. Inside were dozens of pages of Lake's personal journals and videotapes featuring the rape and torture of two women. Twelve people were positively identified from the remains found on the property, but experts believe that there could be upwards of 25 victims. It seemed that Leonard Lake knew that there was no way he was ever getting out of prison. Before he had been arrested, he'd sewn cyanide pills into the lining of his clothing. While in custody, he swallowed several of them, dying in prison before charges could be faced. His accomplice, Charles Ng, wasn't so clever, and instead faced trial for 11 counts of murder, and remains on death row in San Quentin State Prison. Thank you for watching to the end of the video. What do you think about the crimes of Leonard Lake and Charles Ng? Let me know down in the comments right after you like the video and subscribe for more content. With that, this has been Pagan Valley, and I wish you all a good evening.